Jude chapter 1, because there's only one chapter, verses 12 and 13. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They're clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And so what we're looking at in the book of Jude, as you already know, is that false teachers have been infiltrating and have been busy going about undermining the grace of God. Now, what they're doing is they're transforming God's grace into permission, into li- license. It's called license, a license for sin. Now, this is something that Paul writes about, and we saw it when we studied the book of Romans. Um, he had been accused of using grace as an excuse to continue in sin, and he had responded in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, when he wrote, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And he went on to say, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? You see, false teachers were creeping in and saying that because of God's grace, you can continue to live as a pagan, as a heathen. And they were undermining the reality of what grace is. Grace is not given to us so that we can continue in sin. Grace has been given to us so we would be free from its bondage. And so the false teachers are saying, oh, no, continue in sin. And so Jude is speaking about he's dealing with this. He's dealing with the false teachers who have have crept into the church. Now, this is a very small letter. It's only 25 verses. But in this small letter, Jude is very clear in his description of these false teachers. And let me share with you what he says throughout this book. I'll just uh, share with you some of the things he says. He said they're ungodly. They're licentious, they're deniers, they're dreamers who defile the flesh. He says they're rebellious, blasphemers, ignorant, brute beasts, corrupt, spiritual murderers, greedy, morally blemished. They're gluttons, self-serving, empty, fruitless, destructive, and unstable. By today's standards of what the Christian faith is supposed to be, Jude would seem to many people to be judgmental, harsh, and mean-spirited. I mean, can you imagine coming to church and I say, Hi, sinners. How you doing, you gluttons? You know, people, I don't know why, would get hurt. But today's standard, we have um, many people, and I think the term, I don't know if they're still used, they come and they go, but Christians who can be like snowflakes, they get upset, they get hurt feelings, This is strong. Why is he being so mean, somebody would say. How unkind. Was he smiling when he said that? I mean, what's going on? Well, he's being very clear is what he is, and he's saying these are men who are dangerous. Why? Because they're undermining the Christian faith. Now, in our last study, Jude declared three things about these false teachers. He said they've gone the way of Cain, they ran greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and they have perished in the rebellion of Korah. In other words, they are faithless, they're unloving, they're spiritual murderers, they're greedy, and they're rebellious. These are the earmarks of these false teachers. And Jude here continues giving descriptions of these men. And so as he continues here in the verses, in verses 12 and 13, notice he begins by saying, first, that they are spots in your love feast. The word spot, I looked that up because it has one connotation to us today, but the word in Greek has a different connotation than the word uh, spot does for us in English. It, it literally is speaking of hidden reefs, something if you were cruising along in your, in your boat and you hit this, it would be a hidden reef that's going to destroy you. And so that's what he's referring to that. And he says that they are spots in your love feasts. These are, in other words, unrighteous, morally defiled men who cause your love feast, and I'll share with you about that in a moment, but they cause your love feast to be be, be wrecked. They gorge themselves at the love feast without any sense of conviction. Now, what's a love feast? Uh, A love feast in the early church is what has been called a communal meal. 
It, it's when the believers would celebrate together and they actually had meals. When I first got saved back in 1970 and into 71, when I first got saved and began to go to, uh, to have fellowship at a friend of mine's house in particular, we had a lot of these. We had love feasts. We just didn't know we were celebrating the way the early church did. We would gather together, and I know this sounds chauvinistic by today's standards, and it was just a wonderful time, but we, we gathered together, and uh, we were all single. There, were nobody, there was nobody married. We were all 18, 19, 20. We were young. And you know what we would do? We'd gather at a friend's house, and uh, the young ladies who were fellowshipping, they'd actually go into the kitchen, and they would make meals. The ladies would. And uh, today, a lot of young ladies, oh, I wouldn't do that. So I'm not a slave in all of this. But that's what they did. <laughs> that's what they did. And we, the men, would, would gather in fellowship and talk and all. And it wasn't like we were trying to force these women to do this. It wasn't like you, you know, you know put on your apron, get over, take your shoes off, you know, go into that kitchen. We didn't do that. We let them keep their shoes on. And, <laughs> but they would go and they would, they would make meals. And we had a big communal table. And we all would sit at the table and we'd fellowship. We talk about what the Lord is doing, how God has moved in our life. What's he doing now? We, that's what we did. And we didn't even know that we were acting out what the first early Christians did. They would gather together for a meal. Remember in the book of Acts how we began in chapter 2 in verse 42. And we looked at that a while back. And it, it says here, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayer. That was a habit of the early church. They would gather together. And what these people were doing is they were gorging themselves at the love feast, and they had no sense of conviction. The love feast was a meal that was to foster fellowship. It was to not only foster fellowship within the church, but it was also providing meals to those who were less fortunate. And what this is doing with these false teachers who are gorging themselves is it's destroying the fabric of a loving fellowship. He says they're only serving themselves. They don't care for other people. They're lacking in love, and they lack in sacrifice. Now, this is something that wasn't just what Jude was dealing with. Paul actually deals with this in, in 1 Corinthians. The Corinthian church was doing the same thing. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 through 22, listen to what he says. He said, In giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church... I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it, for there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, another's drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. See, what had happened in these love feasts is they began to come together. People would, it was not so much a, a, what we used to call a pot faith. It wasn't so much that they were just gathering together for that, just to eat. It, it had a spiritual uh, sense. It was a communion. It was a community of believers. We love one another. We talk about Jesus. This person doesn't have much at home, so we provided for them. But there were people who were entering into the love feast and gorging themselves. And not only that, they were getting drunk. And so he says, am I supposed to praise you for this? I don't praise you. This is wrong. And so Jude is speaking about the same kind of thing. And that's why he says this concerning them. There are spots, he says, in your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Now, that's the second thing. He said they serve only themselves. That word serve means they actually take care of or tend only themselves. In other words, they're taking advantage of believers because they're self-centered. In Isaiah 56, verse 11, they are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They're shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. So they didn't fear God, and they didn't care about people. He goes on to say they are clouds without water. Clouds without water. They look like it can quench spiritual thirst, but like a cloud, they're unstable and they're transient. They keep moving. 
Now, remember when he says clouds without water in Scripture, very often the uh, rain represents the grace of God. Jesus, speaking concerning rain, had said that God uh, uh, causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. And that's a New Testament picture of the grace of God. God's grace is abounding. When the uh, nation of Israel was entering into the land that they were to be receiving as uh, their own from God himself, he said to them that you're going to go into a land that doesn't have a major river. They, were, they had come out of, out of Egypt, and Egypt uh, uh, found its water source for irrigation, drinking, and everything else from the Nile River. But he said, you're going to go into a land that doesn't have a mighty river. Those of you who've gone to Israel know that the Jordan River isn't that large at all. You know, we, we hear songs with maybe when you were young in, in Sunday school about the mighty Jordan River. And the mighty Jordan River isn't that big at all. There are places you can almost just jump over. It's that small. And so God said, you're entering into a land that doesn't have a river like the mighty Nile. What's going to happen? He says, is I'm going to provide for you rain, the early and the latter rain. He said, and in doing so, you will understand I'm the one who causes the rain to fall and that's going to cause you to understand my grace. And so these are people who have a promise of uh, satisfying spiritual thirst. But in fact, they're clouds without water. They're unstable, is what he's saying. They appear to have grace, but in fact, they're empty. They're, they're clouds that are carried about by the winds. And when they're carried about the, by the winds, it's the winds of false doctrine. Um, that's why Paul had spoken of the need for Bible teaching and the results of Bible teaching. And in the book of Ephesians, verse 14, he had spoken how that God has given you, to, uh, you uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. And he continues as he's speaking concerning the teaching and all. He said in Ephesians 4:14, 4, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine, every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. So false teachers bring the promise of satisfaction of your spiritual thirst, but in fact, they have nothing that they can give you. He says that they are late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead and pulled up by the roots. They're trees that bear no fruit because they're dead. They can't produce any. They are not rooted. They're not grounded in Christ. They have no life. They can produce no fruit. They are raging waves of the sea, verse 13, and they foam up their own shame. He says they, they are foaming up their own degradation. They're destructive, in other words. They're unstable. These, these, are, these are those that are uh, incapable of bringing anything into your life that actually matters. They, they, they can't do that. It, it speaks concerning that foam. They foam up their own shame, and uh, the fruit of their ministry is, is foam. You've been to the beach, and you've seen how there can be foam formed on the, on the shore there when the waves hit, and it just disappears quickly, and that's the point he's making. Isaiah 57, 20 and 21 says, The wicked are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. And then he goes on to say, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. And so they produce nothing that is stable. He says they are wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness. A wandering star is a comet. And like a comet, a comet doesn't provide anything for navigation it doesn't uh, give us anything that we can trust because it's moving. And he speaks about these comets or these wandering stars who cannot provide guidance. And he says, uh, for whom is reserved blackness of darkness. So when he says blackness of darkness, this is a very strong, a very strong statement. What he's saying is um, judgment is reserved for them. They are eternally doomed. There are a lot of Christians who don't seem to care about things like that, though. You know, as a, as a pastor, I am not surprised when somebody will want to argue with me about something, somebody who's not a Christian. Of course, I, I can expect that they're going to have disagreements, and, and, and that's something obvious that, that I respect. I respect the fact that 
people have their own opinions. I don't, I don't have a problem with that at all. And, and I expect that, you know, when it's, what's been the most difficult over the years has been dealing with those who profess no Christ, who defend false teaching. And there are, there are many who do. Many who do. And when you present to them, but what you're being taught is, is not biblical, it's not in Scripture, how angry they can get. How angry they can get. I, 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 you can't imagine over the years how many times I've had conversations with people, even in here in this fellowship, even in this room, where I've said something, be careful about such and so doctrine. I'll give you an example. I said, you know, Mormonism is, is cultic. You know, it's a, that's a true statement. No, no uh, intent to, to uh, hurt somebody's feelings. But I had somebody come up and say, yeah, but their buildings are so pretty. And, and it, it's, kind of, it's kind of like that. It's like you just kind of shake your head. Like, you know, we're talking about truth. We're talking about how to go to heaven. We're talking about God's revelation. We're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about very heavy things. And you're focusing on the fact that this church doesn't have stained glass windows. That's, that's something that's been told to me, too. I mean, you get the most interesting conversations after church. I've told John, you've got to stop doing that. But no, he never stops. But it speaks concerning these false teachers. And he speaks concerning them as having an eternal uh, damnation awaiting them. He uses the phrase, the blackness of darkness, uh, speaking of their, their doom. And it reminds me of a, a parable that Jesus gave in, in the book of Matthew, how that he was speaking about the, the, the parable of the talents. And he speaks of the distribution of five and two and one talents. He speaks concerning it, how the master left his servants in charge, gave one five, gave one two, gave another one talent. He went for a long time at a great distance. You know the parable. And uh, it, it speaks concerning him calling the servants into account. And one, uh, one of the uh, servants had taken the five and doubled it. He now had ten. The other took his two talents and doubled it. He had, he had four. And uh, the other one had one, but he didn't use his talent, that, uh, the amount he was entrusted with. He buried it. And when he was called into account, the master asked him, uh, why did you not produce? Why didn't you do that? He says, well... I, I knew you were austere, I knew you were harsh, and I was afraid, and so I buried it. And the master says, obviously paraphrasing, he says, you knew that I was harsh? Why didn't you take it and invest it? At least put it in the bank, gain some interest. And he was angry at this unjust steward. And at the conclusion of the parable that's found in Matthew 25, verse 30, the master says, throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so what is being spoken of by this in terms of the judgment into the darkness is the speaking of their eternal damnation. And so in verse 14, he continues by saying, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so he speaks concerning Enoch. Now, Enoch is mentioned in the book of Genesis as well as the book of Hebrews, and he's presented as a prophet. In Genesis 5, 21 through 24, it says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, then he was no more because God took him away. So he's mentioned as a prophet later on in Scripture. What's interesting is when you look at this, and he's quote, quoting, and I want you to see this in verse 14, when he says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, there's no record of him prophesying in Scripture. What, what we see is a tradition that had been inspired. It's an inspired tradition that had been handed down uh, through tradition 
and was accepted as, as truth. There are those who say that there was a book, uh, the book of Enoch, that was it's called the, uh, the Ethiopian book of Enoch, but uh, the commentators I used did not refer to it as an actual source, and so they said it is, it's, it's better to just note this, that he was regarded as a prophet and that this particular prophecy was recorded through t tradition and is repeated here in the book of Job, uh, rather Jude, because there's no mention in Scripture of this prophecy. But this is what was said, verse 15, to execute judgment on all and to convict all who are ungodly. Now, Jude used two particular words four times. He used the word all four times in one verse. And he used the word ungodly four times in one verse. Now, what is ungodly? Ungodly, you hear that term, but you don't hear it too often anymore unless you're reading your Bible. The word ungodly speaks of literally without God. That's what ungodly is. It, it speaks of a lack of reverence towards God. It speaks of impiety, outrageous wickedness, ungodly. Um, let, me, let me give an illustration from ancient history, speaking of my life. When I grew up, you could, you could, you know, tag mark up various places. But you never marked up, you never tagged a church. You just didn't. You'd go around and maybe you'd write your name or whatever. But you never tagged a church. A church was a holy place. Even the gangsters knew that, right? Several years ago now, though, there's a church in Chino here in the city. And the kids in the neighborhood, the young, young men in the neighborhood, were dealing drugs in the church. Some of you are too young to know this. Some of you older will remember. Churches used to be left open all night. How many of you remember that? Anybody? Churches used to be left open all night. Think about that for a minute. The doors weren't closed. You could walk into a church in any neighborhood and go into the church and pray. It was always open because that's what churches used to be. And so it was a very important uh, part of your neighborhood. And so what had happened is drug dealers had begun going into the open doors of the church and were dealing in, in, the, um, in the front of the church and uh, in the foyer. And what happened was some of the people, some of you may remember when this happened. It's been a while now. But some of the members of the church had gotten upset that this was taking place. And so they actually had citizens, members of the church, who were walking and staying inside of the, uh, the foyer there to protect it from this. Now, Marie's grandmother lived right across the street from the church this was happening in. And somebody got in her yard, a gunman got in her grandmother's yard and knelt down behind a, a, a block wall and killed two people who were in the church. They shot them from across the street from Marie's grandmother's house and killed these people. There was a time when that kind of thing is unheard of. Not anymore. There's no more sense that there is a right and there's a wrong. And so that's what ungodly is. It's impiety. It's a lack of fear of God. It's outrageous wickedness. And, and what he's saying is God will surely judge those who reject him. He says God will execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly. What does he convict these ungodly people of? Well, their ungodly deeds. Speaking of uh, the expressions of their labor. Their ungodly way. Speaking of their overall lifestyle. Their way of life. And they're ungodly sinners, meaning that they're preeminently sinful. They're wicked. They're stained with vice. He's saying God is going to bring judgment. And no one will escape. In Hebrews 12, 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us? us from heaven and what's he going to do verse 16 he's going to execute judgment it says in verse 16 these are grumblers complainers walking according to their own lusts 
They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. And so he speaks concerning the way that they live. And I'll, I'll close with a couple thoughts about that. But we'll be picking that up in the future. Now, when he speaks concerning executing judgment here in verse 15, that takes place at the second coming of Christ. Let me give you some details about that. I'm going to take a moment to do this. The second coming occurs after the seven-year period called the tribulation. The second coming is found in Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And at that time, Christ is going to deliver those who have trusted him. He's going to bring spiritual revival to Israel and the world. He's going to reestablish the kingdom of David who will rule under Jesus and will rule for the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Now, when he speaks of executing judgment, the judgment is divided into his judgment of Israel as well as his judgment of Gentiles. The judgment of Israel, and I know I'm giving you a lot of information, but that's so that you'll buy my tape. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the judgment of Israel. During the tribulation, the seven-year period, and just synopsizing this, during the tribulation, many Jews will die. In Zechariah 13, verse 8, it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. Two-thirds of Israel during the tribulation, according to the prophet Zechariah, will die. Two-thirds of Israel. But the survivors are going to be delivered by Jesus when he returns. And then all Israel will be regathered from the entire world. Ezekiel 39, 28 says, Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them anymore there. So when these survivors are gathered, they're going to be judged. Ezekiel 20, verses 35 through 38 I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge out from among you the rebels and those who transgress against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So he's going to purge Israel of the rebels. They will have survived, but they have to pass under the rod. That's another way of saying pass under judgment. Remember this, not all who survive the tribulation enter the kingdom because some are unsaved. In Romans 9, 6 through 8, it is not as though God's word has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So there will be Jews who have come to faith in Messiah, and they're going to be saved. Romans 11, 26 says, all Israel shall be saved. He's speaking of those who've come to faith in Messiah. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So he's speaking concerning the judgment that is going to come in verse 15, to execute judgment on all. This is the second coming. Now, the judgment of the Gentiles is called the judgment of the sheep and the goats. That's found in Matthew 25, thir uh, verses 31 through 36. And that's what's going to be taking place at that time. Now, moving on and taking you a little bit further in verse 16, and I keep looking at the time. I've been doing that lately just to pretend I'm going to stop. <laughs> he says in verse 16, these are grumblers, complainers, Sounds like my staff. Walking <laughs> according to their own lusts. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. 
So I'll take you for a few minutes into this, and I'm going to actually really just stop at verse uh, 17. But notice again, these are murmurs, verse 16, complainers, and they walk according to their own lusts. Again, these are the traits of false teachers. Uh, a murmurer is a grumbler. It, it's the one who is discontented and is always complaining against God. He, he speaks of the, the complainers uh, as uh, the ones who are constantly expressing a grievance. They're the fault finders. Nothing that, that, that happens in their life is, is ever their fault. It's always somebody else's. And, and so he says, these are the murmurs. These are the complainers. Why are they, are they that way? They walk according to their own lusts. Now, what he's dealing with is dealing with the critical attitude of false teachers. They live according to their own fleshly passions or their evil inclinations. One of the things, one of the traits of a false teacher that I've seen is that they're very, they're, well, they're discontent, and the reason they are is because they have no peace with the Lord. But what they do is they traffic in discontent. So they'll knock on your door, and they'll say to you, have you noticed how bad everything is? Well, naturally, if you have eyes to see, yeah, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad, especially if you're married. It's pretty bad. <laughs> and you can see that, right? And so they trade on that. I can remember as a new believer, I, uh, I was less than a couple months old in the Lord, and I still remember uh, someone knocking on my mom's front door. I was still living at home. It was just before I went into the military. And I remember opening the door, and there was somebody there from the uh, Watchtower organization. And they began to share with me about how bad everything was. And that's the tactic they, to this day, continue using. They wanted to show you how bad everything is. And, uh, and they started quoting scripture and, and all of that. And I still remember, and I'm a brand new Christian, but I'd already been being taught. And, and I said, but didn't Jesus say, when these things happen, look up for your redemption draws nigh? aren't I having, aren't I supposed to, you know, I was taught that from the beginning. Aren't I supposed to have a hopeful attitude? Am I not looking for the great deliverance of the Lord who's going to take us out of this place, but aren't we supposed to abide until he comes, occupy until he comes? Aren't we supposed to win as many of the lost as we can, bring them to heaven with us? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? So why am I going to be upset for the world being what the world is? Why do I expect the world to be a Christian? The world's aren't, the world's not Christians. You know, they're not, they're heathens. They need God. And so are we. So are we. Of all people, we should understand that. We're just like that. And then sometimes we're even worse than that. Because we all have real testimonies. You know your testimony. You have the one you give people and the real one that you don't tell anybody about. <laughs> so we know who we are. And we know what we've been. Right? Right? So how can I be so mad at the world constantly for being what it is? And yet you have the false uh, teachers who come in complaining and grumbling. Everything's bad, poor, everything's this and that. But they don't point you to the light. They don't point you to the hope. They don't point you to the joy that comes from coming to know Jesus Christ. They don't give you a purpose. They don't give you any promises. They don't give anything. And that's what he's speaking about. He said they're murmurers. They're complainers. And they, they live their lives according to their own lust. They're critical in everything. They're filled with fleshly passion. And that's what they do. And, and because of that, what they try to do is they try to deceive you. Notice they mouth great swelling words. It, when he says that, he, it, this means that they speak arrogant and, and they preach uh, empty claims. Second Peter 2.18 says, they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They flatter people that they may gain advantage. They will honor certain people because they can gain advantage by knowing these people. They will look into a group and they will see the most promising and the most influential. And they work to gain their loyalty. Because they know that once they get the one who is respected by everybody else, once they get that one to follow them, they can gain the rest of them. So they use flattering words. They use empty speech. They make you feel that you're better than you are. 
and then they hook you. And once they get you, then they use you. And that's what he's saying they do. They're arrogant. They make arrogant claims. They flatter people to gain advantage because they want to use you. Paul speaks of them in this way. I'm paraphrasing, but he says that what they do is they are spiritual scalp hunters. They, they use your flesh to build their ministries up. And so as he's speaking concerning this, he's making it very clear. You cannot put up with false teaching. You cannot listen to the things that they're saying because the things that they're saying are not scripturally sound. One last thing, and then we're going to celebrate communion together. When I first got saved, and I'll close with this thought. 20 years old. I'm trying to find my words because I was not intending to share this, and so now I have to find a better way to say what I ordinarily would say a little more. Um, some of you might understand. When I first got saved at 20 years of age, after the years of abuse of drugs and alcohol and everything that went along with that, I had in my heart a bitterness. The Lord has removed it. I still have the same passion, but not the bitterness. Because I had been raised in the, in the church, in the Catholic church. And I had believed what I was taught. But I hadn't been taught the truth. And when I went to Calvary Chapel and I started hearing actual Bible studies, there was a resentment in my heart. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a month or two at the most after getting saved that I received a letter from the church that I had one time attended, St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs. I'll never forget this, guys. It was written to David Rosales, and I opened it, and I thought, what is this? And I read it from your church. And it said, we're looking forward to your, your gift, financial gift to the church. Now, I had interesting memories of that. I won't go into it other than the fact that the very first time I ever drank beer was at St. Pius X Church. And I was eight years old. And I broke in with two of my friends and my brother into one of the um, refrigerating, refrigerator units that they had. And this was this, and we stole beer and drank it and walked home after catechism. But it was in the same church just shortly before this that the priest had said, if you want to make a vow to God that you will never drink, please stand to your feet. And I stood up at about eight years of age. I want to be a man of God. I'm eight years old. I still remember the priest just staring at me as the only little boy standing up. I still remember that. And he just, but I'm going to do this. I, my very first beer I ever drank was in the church that had us stand up to say we wouldn't drink beer. And even at that age, I started thinking there's something wrong here. I didn't know what the word hypocrisy meant, but that's what it was. How can you have people make a pledge not to drink and then sell them the beer you told them to make a pledge not to drink? How can you do that, right? So I had resentment in me. And so they wrote me a letter asking me to send them money. And I sent them a letter. I still remember some of what I said. I said, it's funny that you have written me telling me to give a gift to my church when you haven't noticed I haven't been in your church for the last three, no, the last eight years. I have not been in Mass for eight years. And now I'm getting a letter telling me to send money to my church. I said, I'm going to give you something you never gave me. I'm giving you the gospel. And I still remember writing scriptures 
You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I wrote all these scriptures and I said to the priest, you need to receive Jesus Christ. Instead of writing people things about him, you ought to come to know him. See, so I've mellowed since then. I really have. But the fire is still there because it's the truth that sets you free. And false teachers bring you into bondage. And that's why Jude is so upset. And that's why he uses these strong words. Because these are people who are promising you things and they're bringing you into bondage. They're not encouraging you to live a holy life set apart for Christ. They're saying, do what you want and you'll still be okay. He says, no, these are like clouds without rain. These people are false teachers and he's branding them. Why? Because salvation matters, guys. Truth matters. Now, we don't have to be angry about it. I'm not, but I am passionate about it. Why? Because Jesus set me free because I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. I was hopeless and now I have the hope of Christ in me. And I loved him so much that I started telling my mom and my dad and my brother and my sisters and everybody else. To this day, 53 years later, I still have the joy that God sets the sinner free. And that comes through the truth. And that's something that matters. 